I'm Kate, and on this episode of Bite Size, we're exploring kombucha and carbonation. We've actually already done a whole episode on brewing your own kombucha, and this part is really focused on that second stage of fermentation, which is carbonation, because as we were doing the first episode, we realized that this honestly deserves its own episode because it's pretty complex, and we got pretty excited and into it, and one thing led to another, and somehow we got here. In addition to the science being a whole nother array of concepts, when we talked to our kombucha expert Molly for the first time, well, she got us a little nervous about this second step. Here's why. For me, the hardest part when I was learning how to make it was deciding if I wanted it to be fizzy and then how fizzy and getting it fizzy. Making kombucha that is not fizzy is so much easier because you can ferment it in an open container, you know, just like a cheesecloth over it, it's exposed to the air. So all the CO2 that's being produced during the fermentation releases. But that does not taste like kombucha you get in the store. And the challenge there is if you bottle it and there's too much sugar, the bottle will explode. And it won't just pop off the cap, the entire glass will shatter. Um, and you will get glass shards everywhere. First, let's recap where we are in the kombucha brewing process. So there's actually two main stages to the kombucha brewing process. The first, which takes longer, is when we brew the tea, add in the scoby, and wait for the microbes to make it more acidic and produce other flavors. You can learn all about that in our first video here. Now the second stage is what we're focusing on here, and it's somewhat similar, but it's shorter, and it's all about the carbonation. Carbonation is simply bubbles of carbon dioxide within the liquid, just like you'd see with a seltzer or a soda. But unlike those beverages, which require you to add in carbon dioxide through some sort of force or pressure, we don't have to do anything at all with the kombucha. It will produce carbon dioxide on its own. So we just let it sit. So to start the second stage, we have to do just a couple of quick steps. We take our newly brewed kombucha that just went through the first stage of fermentation, pour it into a new container along with some fruit juices or whatever flavors we want. Yep, this is finally where you can add in those flavors and have some fun with that. Then close the container and let it sit for a day or two and we'll see that the carbonation naturally builds over time. Seems pretty simple, right? And it actually is. Although if you're going to try this out yourself, we highly recommend checking out our supplementary materials to learn more about exactly what type of bottles to use, recommended flavors, and just some small tips that make a difference. Honestly, it's pretty crazy how quickly the carbonation builds. Within a day, we saw tons of bubbles. So here's what's going on. So how does that carbonation naturally build? Well, we have to go back to the microbes, specifically the yeast. Just like in the first stage of fermentation, the yeast ferment, and as they do that, they produce carbon dioxide. So when we add something like pomegranate juice, which is full of natural sugars, it's not just adding flavor for us, but also a food source for the yeast to continue to ferment. It's also why we added in some white sugar when we did flavors that didn't have much natural sugar, like lemon juice. Now, in addition to adding flavor and a source of sugar, the primary difference we see between the first and second stage of fermentation is that we capped the container during the second stage. This prevents the gas from escaping. So while the whole process was happening in the first stage too, and we can actually see this, we'll notice some bubbles within the liquid and on the top in the first stage, these can freely come and go because it's just covered with a coffee filter. And that's intentional because we need airflow. And that's why we can't do both stages at the same time. Because when we cap the container, we cut off air supply. And the acetic acid bacteria need air supply to get oxygen to convert ethanol into acetic acid. And while there's a little bit of oxygen in the container in the second stage when we cap it, both within the liquid and the headspace, this oxygen quickly gets depleted as the bacteria metabolize it. And so at this point, the kombucha isn't going to get more acidic, it's just getting more bubbly. So there were a variety of safety precautions we took based on our Googling, research, and talking to experts. So when doing this, it's important to burp the bottles daily, which is essentially opening it and then closing it again to allow extra gas to quickly release from the bottle and to give it headspace, which is some extra airspace at the top of the bottle. If we don't, the bottle can literally explode. May seem a bit dramatic here, but carbonation really can be that powerful. So why? Over time, the amount of gas particles inside the container continues to increase as the yeast continue to ferment and produce more and more carbon dioxide. And just like any gas, these molecules are rapidly moving around in all directions, bouncing around, bumping into each other, and the sides of the container. The result of all of these collisions is pressure. 
So as we add more particles, there are more collisions leading to more pressure. Eventually, if the bottle continues to sit without any burping or releasing of gas, so many particles are produced that there's just too much pressure for the walls of the container and it will break. By simply playing around with the container itself, both in its material and volume, we can see a little bit more how pressure works. If we seal it with a balloon on top instead of capping it, we see that as gas particles are produced, they quickly fill up the balloon. Because unlike a glass bottle, the balloon expands in volume as the number of gas particles increase. This is the same exact concept as using a bike pump to fill up a tire or inflating a soccer or basketball. They have a variable volume that can change depending on how many air particles are within the container. Now we also did this in a variety of seasons and found that when the air temperature is warmer, the balloon expanded significantly more quickly than at cooler temperatures. We have a number of theories as to why, but we're going to leave that up to you to think about. So then that got me thinking, could we somehow quantify and look at this pressure in a more scientific, measurable way? But I wasn't really sure where to start. Like, could I somehow use a pressure gauge? First off, a big thank you to Tony and Devin who helped us get started in thinking about how to build these prototypes. Overall, we felt pretty good about our engineered design, given the budget, the materials, and where we started. We were actually able to measure and see the pressure build over a couple of hours. However, after those few hours, we saw the pressure drop and it would restart and reset. So even though we thought we had fully sealed the bottle and didn't see any gas escaping and actually push on the bottle to check this, obviously there was some sort of gas escaping in some way. So there's still room for improvement, but maybe that's up to you to figure out. While I would have loved to quantify the pressure a little bit more, I think ultimately we did accomplish our goal, which was to explore pressure and we did it safely and with household materials. Thanks for tuning in on this episode of Bite Size. Be sure to like and subscribe for more.